Hello to the Econ Buff podcast. I'm your host, Lee Stitzel. With me today is Dr. Rex Pieski. Rex is a professor of economics at, at West Texas A&M. Uh, Rex, welcome. Good to be here. Rex, today our topic is labor market fluidity, labor mobility, um, and kind of trends that we're seeing in that and um, how that's affecting the broader market. So how do you see labor market, uh, excuse me, labor mobility um, do you see that as declining? What evidence do you see um, for or against sort of the mobility of labor? Well, Lee, pretty much any any way you measure labor mobility, which, you know, of course, labor mobility is the, the rate at which a worker will move to uh, take on a new job. Pretty much however you measure labor mobility, we see it declining in the United, uh, see it declining in the United States. So, uh, if you look at how often people move from one state to the next, uh, we're off around 50% or so from the average from uh, you know 1950-ish to 1980-ish or so. Even if you look at um, people moving to a different county uh, within a state, uh, we're off about 30% or so from from what we saw, uh, I guess, in the post-war gener- uh, post-war generation. Also, if, if, if you look at um, labor mobility among, uh, among different um, economic classes, you know, um, you know rich, poor, uh, regardless of what demographic you look, look at, it seems as though people are moving less for, for their jobs, to take new jobs. Yeah, so the, the, those are all great, all great points. Um, you know, so if I can just chime in with a couple of, of academic uh, studies. So... Uh, I always assign in my graduate class some readings by uh, Davis and Haltwanger. They're two of the top guys that sort of work in the labor field. Um, I have a quote here from them that says, the loss of labor market fluidity suggests the U.S. economy is becoming less dynamic and responsive in recent decades. Your 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 comments highlight that. Um, given that we see declining labor market mobility, I think that's undeniable at this point. Why do you view that as a as a potential problem. Well, I think most economists view that as a problem because it might be reflective of some underlying tendencies in, in the economy that are particularly worrisome. Um, the best source or, uh, you know, the best person I know of that have, that's written about this extensively is, is Tyler, Tyler Cowan. Mm. I wrote a book called The Great Stagflation a couple of years ago, and, and he, he was, he's very concerned about declining labor mobility because he thinks that it is a reflection of, for whatever reason, of our economy becoming less dynamic. Uh, people are taking less chances. Uh, right. They're 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 entrenching, entrenched, entrenching right. instead of moving. Sorry about that. Entrenching instead of moving. And um, you know, if if that's reflective of broader trends uh, in the economy, then it, it could definitely signal uh, a, a slowdown in economic growth and innovation and dynamism in in other ways as well. So what I'm hearing then is is you're saying that's more of a uh, symptom of something else. Do you think there are sort of direct problems that it poses or or it's really just something that we're looking at and saying because we see this something else is wrong? Yeah, I I, I think it could I think it could be both. I, I think it could be both. It, it could be um you know the broader trends that that, that Cowan seems to see, uh, see or it could be the direct result of uh, you know applications of bad policies, you know, for instance, that could be causing right. this. And if that's the case, um, then um, you know it would require different solutions. So, I mean, I'm intrigued by sort of the difference here. So we we could have on one hand policies that are that are causing problems that are then manifesting in the labor market. And, you know, that's a thread that I'd like to pull today. Um, okay. But if I can, if I can focus for just a moment here, how how is it then that it would be a problem in and of itself? So, what is it that we would be concerned about? Suppose that I could convince you by whatever uh, I don't know how this would be done, but by whatever data it would take. Okay, there's nothing that is a greater evil lurking in the dark behind this labor mobility. We just have low labor mobility. Would you then no longer be concerned or? Well, again, you, you, you would have to think about what the reasons were. Of course, of course. For, uh, for the declining labor market mobility. If, if, if people were um, just making their own independent decisions more content 
uh, for whatever reason to, to mm. stay put, then mm-hmm. that would be more benign right. of an explanation. If, if, if the decline in labor mobility was the result of increases in efficiency in job matching, right. Um, then of course I don't. If, if that's the reason, I don't think we should be worried about it at all. No, of course. So, you know, think about how that might um, think about how that might work. And actually, in the literature, this is talked about quite a bit. Um, you know, a, a generation or two ago, it was very very difficult for someone to find information on other places. So, um, you know, if you woke up one morning thinking, "Gosh, I I really." Like Oregon, I might want to move to Oregon mm-hmm. or somewhere like that. You, you didn't, you don't really have an easy, cheap way of finding out what it's like in Oregon. But today, if you woke up and wanted to learn about Oregon, you can easily find out uh, a lot of different things about what it would be like to live in Oregon. It's right. very, very easy to find what jobs are available there. It's very, very easy to find out how much housing costs there. It's very, very easy to find out information about what the schools are like there. And, you know, you name anything that you might want to know before you move to Oregon about Oregon, and you can right. learn about that uh, almost costlessly, Right. Uh, which, is a, which is a new thing for, new thing for humanity. So the decline in, in labor mobility might just be, um, you know, based on the fact that uh, uh, people are just making good matches to begin with. Or perhaps and, the grass doesn't look as green on the other side if you yeah. have more access to the information. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, the grass being greener on the other side is is another benign reason why people have suggested that labor mobility might be going down. Yeah, it's fascinating. Generation or two ago, or up to a generation or two ago, it seemed that the economy was more geographically diverse in terms of employment. Uh, oper- opportunities. So, in other words, the kind of work that needed to be done in in the Rust Belt. That's why we have these names for for places like this. Was was different than the kind of work that you might do in West Texas. Would be different than the kind of work that you might do in California. Um, because of transitions in the economy, that that really seems to have changed quite a bit. So, the kinds of jobs that you might do in in Dallas are going to be the same kind of jobs that you might do in Seattle or Chicago or New York or, or, or anywhere. So you've, you've, you know, one of the things that we may have seen that may be an explanation for this declining geographic mobility just stems from the fact that you don't have to move, right? The, 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 our economy is dominated by, you know, almost generic service sector jobs right now, for lack of a better Better word, um, you know, it's it's no different selling insurance in Amarillo, Texas, than it is selling insurance in Green Bay or any you know any other place that you might that, that you might think of. So there's a declining need to move for work, and so people are people are moving less for work. Um, these two explanations that are benign are very very interesting to think about, but uh, I think the literature uh, at least. Uh, partially rejects them as complete explanations as to what is really going on with declining labor mobility. So, so if I remember correctly, there is quite a bit of research on, well, people working from home, working remotely, things like that. Um, that would be something else, yes. And I'm not even sure, and maybe you have a different opinion than me, I'm not even sure I know which uh, direction I would expect that to influence labor mobility. Do I move less because I can stay here and work, or do I move more because now I can I can live in Los Angeles and live on the beach or whatever it is that I'm wanting to do, um, and move? It's, maybe those, both of those things are happening. Um, so the the remote working is a really interesting and I think increasing phenomenon, but it's pretty new. Um, so let, let me back up just a little bit, unless you had something to say about that. No, no, no. That's I mean, that's interesting. I, I, I agree. I don't know what uh, what direction, uh, as far as, uh, for lack of a better word, telecommuting. Right. Uh, remote work or, you know, that's, that's probably not the 21st century term for it. Um, I don't know what direction that would push this. That would definitely be an empirical question. So let me take this back then, because you said a couple of interesting things. So we, we get information. Do I want to move to Oregon? Do I not? Um, and so the two things pop out to me immediately. The, the first one is, well, one of those things that allows me to gain information is travel is so much easier and cheaper and safer. Um, but maybe that's also a substitute for actually moving to Oregon. I'm like, I like Oregon, uh, but I'll just fly up there and 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 
climb around in the mountains or whatever it is I'd want to do in Oregon. Um, it, so it's kind of an interesting possibility that all that information that I'm gathering, like you made the point a moment ago, could just paint a pure, clearer picture. The grass isn't really as green, so mm -hmm. over there, so I don't, um, so I don't want to move there. Or, or maybe that information, and I would think combined with travel, it just substitutes for me actually having to move there. I can live here. I don't have to go through the trouble of moving or finding a job, and I'll just spend the weekend in Oregon this weekend. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and that's an extremely good point, too. So, um, you know, our, our lives are more, um, the decisions that we make in our lives are more independent of one another. So if you really like the mountains, you, you don't have to live in the mountains to enjoy them. Right. Um, you know, it's not difficult for a middle class person to, to spend a couple of weeks in the mountains every year. And maybe that's enough. You don't have to live there anymore. Uh, you know, travel 50 years ago or so is extremely expensive. So if you really like the mountains or the beach or whatever, that's where you had to that's where you had to live. And because of the you know, more efficient matching uh, going on, uh, perhaps now, um, you know, people are finding their place more quickly and just and just staying put. So the second thing that I'd like to follow up on that, um, the the timing of the decrease in labor mobility sort of since the 90s accelerating in the 2000s and we've kind of dropped to new lows in recent years. Do you think that matches up with your story related to our ability to gather information? That seems to be something that has happened extremely recently. Maybe you have a better sense of that than I do. Um, but also it seems to accelerate as we get more and more sort of ways to gather information and to experience that world. Um, do you think those timelines match up? I'd, I'd almost gather that they don't. So it seems to me like that, you know, according to most of the literature, this, this acceleration of the decline in labor mobility, if that makes any, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, labor mobility, I'll put it like this, labor mobility started to fall around 1980, okay. is what a lot of people seem to think. And um, I don't know of any explosion in information technology or decrease in the travel cost uh, that would have been big enough about that time that would have, um, you know, created such a big inflection point in in how we um, how we live our how we live our lives. I mean, I guess you had the deregulation of airlines about that time, but. I don't know if that single event or something like that would be enough to explain. If you're going to look at this empirically, if you were really going to try to find out the answer uh, using data, th that would be, you know, regardless of what context, regardless of what uh, data you were using, you know, matching up the timing would really, really be key uh, to, to really getting insight into, into what's, what's going on. So if you've got the idea that, well, expl uh, you know, a, a sharp decrease in, in, the, in the cost of travel and the cost of gathering information about other places is what's causing this, then you definitely expect to see that coincide with actual migration patterns. And if you don't see that, even if the trends are going in the directions that you expect, if the timing is off, then you, you definitely have a problem convincing anybody that that was an explanation or even part of the explanation. Right, so that's, it isn't to say it isn't a cause, um, but if the decrease in labor mobility is happening well before sort of those, the age of the internet and you know this ability to travel quickly, cheaply and safely, um, that we sort of attribute to like late 90s and really taking off in the early 2000s, something else has to at least be a yeah, role. Yeah, you've got something else going on. That isn't to say that it couldn't sustain it or make it um, sort of a more dramatic uh, effect. But I think it's been, um, I don't know, speak about this too precisely because I, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's been somewhat of a steady decline. Is that of in labor mobility? I think so. I think so. And again, it's it's been, um, you know, decreasing since around 1980. And it's it's I mean it's certainly a puzzle in economics. This, this is one of the things that um, economists should have the tools to explain, and something that would be very very good if we were able to explain this. And and yet it's it's really an open question, and it's amazing for something to be an open question for for twenty thirty plus years. Right? It is. It is. So um, let, let's talk maybe a little bit about the um, who benefits and and who loses. So if the labor market is, is more dynamic, who, who do you see as, as winners? Well, I mean, assuming that labor, you know, that a, you know, churning labor market 
um, is good for is good for innovation and is good for the productive capacity of the economy, then then we all win. Right. If the labor market is is more dynamic, if it increases GDP, if it increases the pace of um, innovation, if it helps people more be more productive by getting better job matches um, and uh, acquiring experience more rapidly in various ways, and that's that's good for that's good for all of us. So overall economy in the sense that a dynamic labor market and a dynamic economy, as you mentioned, Tyler Cowan's work earlier, uh, everybody wins in that sense. Um, that to me is the story of like creative destruction, right? Should and be. so yeah. part of my concern, and, and I don't know, maybe I would need to think clearly about drawing the link between what the mechanism is here, um, you know, but the dynamic labor market is probably both a cause and a symptom of good, good creative destruction um, happening sort of economy wide, um, not to jump ahead too much into sort of causes of this decline and, and how we would view them as um, being good or bad things. But if the decline in the labor market mobility causes us to have less creative destruction, we'd almost always think that's a that's a bad thing. Do you have a comment about that? Oh, no, I mean, it certainly would be a bad thing. Um, creative destruction, you know, so-called creative destruction is, you know, inseparable from, from economic growth. I, I don't think that you can have one without without the other. So if, if there's not a, um, a, you know, almost constant... Uh, availability of new products and of new ways of doing and thinking about things, then almost by definition we're stuck. Mm -hmm. So creative destruction is essential. And you know how essential is labor market uh, mobility to creative destruction would be a very important question to think about. So there's some people that say the labor market mobility and the dynamic nature of the labor market is more important for uh, both younger firms and younger workers. Do you think that's true, or, or is that probably overstated? Well, I mean, it's it's probably a story that would fit the facts. A, a lot of the explanations um, that we haven't talked about yet, but some of the explanations for a cause of, of lower labor market mobility is the fact that in, in recent years, we, we seem to have had a slowdown of new firms being mm -hmm. produced. And I think I would kind of surprise people. Uh, when you get into labor market data, there are a lot of things that would surprise people. But uh, you know, actually, a, a, a slowdown of, of startup firms, of, of new firms in the economy, is is something that uh, a lot of people have have noticed, have been surprised about, and think is really, really, con really, really concerning. Um, you know, if if you know, on the other hand, if we're in a world where we can work anywhere and start a firm anywhere, um, you know, you might just but, you know, those two things might not be linked at all because firms could just move to where the labor was instead of starting a firm and attracting labor, labor from, from everywhere. So if I saw a higher rate of startups, or I mean, it could even be the same, but a decrease in the rate of startups and young firms doesn't fit this story. But if I saw a higher rate of the startups and then I saw declining labor mobility, maybe we would just chalk that up to the firms going, well, all the workers that we would want are in this area. So we go there. But we don't see that. So that seems unlikely to be an explanation. Yeah. Uh, l let me uh, piggyback off that and something that you said a little bit earlier. You said, well, you know, all the jobs are sort of general service jobs and we have this kind of economy. That's almost certain to be true. Um, and if I want to do certain kinds of work, in a lot of ways, I can do those anywhere. Uh, now that I think jives against kind of the public perception of the economy is increasingly when we think about business in America, we think about really large firms that have specific physical locations. And sometimes the politicians are even trying to attract those jobs into certain places like we saw with New York and um, Amazon. Now, I think you're right. And I think both of these things can be true at the same time. Uh, if I'm if I have a set of skills that is in computer programming, it's almost certain that I can go anywhere and be successful doing that. Uh, what if I am a computer programmer though? So what about, another way to say this would be, do you think there's a difference um, in labor mobility sort of by occupation? Well, I'm not sure, I wonder, is there data on that? I haven't seen that. That doesn't mean it's not I mean, out there. It doesn't mean it's not there. Well, that'd be something you'd want to want to look at. So, um, you know, think think about um, 
you know, you, you'd want to think about what categories of labor were, were more generic uh, in reference to geography, you know, um, something like a doctor, right? You know, for instance, a general practitioner, or pediatrician, there's going to be a demand for your services anywhere. Um, you know, you can pick where you want to live. Uh, you can go where you want to live and you stay there forever because you've checked it out beforehand. Now, another thing, a computer programmer might be, um, you know, might, might be a unique case because, you know, you can, you can be born and study and, and, and grow up to be a computer programmer anywhere, but all of the jobs for computer programming are going to seem to be concentrated in a few places, you know, Silicon Valley. And, you know, there, there are a few, few places in the country that would be known as tech heavy, you know, maybe, you know, Silicon Valley, North Carolina, Austin, other, other Seattle, um, you know, other, other places where, um, you know, people working in technology in one way or another might gravitate towards. So, um, you know, seeing what the driver was and any differences in labor mobility among occupations might be really key to understanding what's really going on here. That might be an interesting thing to look at. I'm it, sure people have, but that, I'm not aware of that. That always is an interesting, you know, if you, if you can have different assumptions about different occupations, it can, can lead you to kind of paint a clearer picture. So. Now, maybe while you were saying that, I was thinking, is it true that a computer programmer can only work in uh, Cupertino or whatever? That's obviously not true. Uh, I can get programming jobs, but they're sort of fundamentally different, right? right. If, if I get a job, I can, I can have one, um, you know, somewhere in Texas, for example, and it can be a great job. But if I want to work on the big questions, if I want to work on the stuff that's really sort of shaping that environment, so, so maybe I'm falling into a certain fallacy, right? Which is, um, you know, we look at what's going on with the best of the best, and we think that that's representative of the whole market. Um, I hadn't thought about that before um, you raised the point that you raised about sort of where the, the top tech jobs might be. Um, not everybody is out there trying to, um, be the very best in their field, maybe it matters more where they are than what they're doing, yeah, but they and, want to be computer programmers. And, and, and that could be the case. It's it's never going to be all or nothing um, in any of these in any of these fields. That that's why looking at very you know, even small and subtle variations across occupations might might be instructive on on what the answer to this question ultimately ultimately is. Um, you know, so uh, well, I mean, what you said exactly true, right? You you can get a job as a programmer almost anywhere in in, in the United States, uh, for instance. Um, but is it, are are the patterns of work different in that occupation than they are for you know being a doctor or being a nurse or being an insurance salesman or a college professor or something like that? So there there might be some occupations that are more uniform in the population in the economy than than others. And so that would provide um, that would provide um, you know data for you variation in data that you could exploit and try to answer some of these questions really really deeply. And that that'd be fascinating. You, of course, it's easiest for you and me to think about being a professor. Uh, but in some ways, if I want to be the best professor, I have to be in Boston, don't I? Right. So or Chicago or or, or some of these top schools. Um, but it doesn't seem as dramatic in in our field as it does in, it, no. in computer programming. It, it, right? it, and it may it may not be, um, and I I, I don't th I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think that is some variation that somebody could exploit to try to answer this question. Yeah, fascinating. So, um, do you think there are any potential losers from a more dynamic market? We talked about who the winners could be. Um, do you think there's there's any losers? Well, I mean that's a hard to. I mean, my first reaction is no, because, you know, at the end of the day, we are all making our own decisions about where to live. Um, so the only way I can even begin to answer that question, this would sort of go right in with what we said about the the, the, the winners of, of this, is, is labor market mobility, does it have some characteristic of a public good, mm. right? So, you know, let's say I want to stay put, you know, I want to have the same job in the same town. For, for, for forever, uh, I'm I'm going to benefit from other people moving um, to you know to to and from. So so uh, that so that's counterintuitive. Un, unpack that for us just a little yeah. bit. Well, it's it, let me give you another example of what I mean by this. And this this might be off topic a, a, a little bit. So um, you know if 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 there were two 
planets or two economies that were exactly the same and one had a lot of labor mobility and the other one had none and they were the same in every respect uh, where would you want to live you would probably want to live in the place that had more labor mobility and that would be true regardless of how much you wanted to move uh, it would be almost exactly the same thing if i if i asked the question of you know, if you could live in two worlds, one where everybody worked really hard and the other world where everybody did not work very hard, regardless of how hard you wanted to work, you would rather live in the world where everybody was working hard because that provides all kinds of spillover benefits for spillover benefits for you. So I don't think that that, you know, we, we can't think of um, we can't think of losers in this process uh, the way we ordinarily think of, of, of someone of someone losing. So, so let me say two things. First, I, I like your examples. The, the second one makes the first one very clear, right? It, it, it's uh, obvious that we would want to live where the hard workers are, even if I'm myself not a hard worker. Um, and, and so I think that's enlightening for the, for the first case. Let me play devil's advocate for, for just one moment then. In a scenario where we're more dynamic, does it necessarily lead to a place where um, we have more of this sort of Google, Amazon effect, where more of the jobs are sucked into these, um, into these areas focused on specific work. Um, of course, if if we're familiar with the public finance field, they're taking advantage of uh, agglomeration economies. Right. Is does a more dynamic economy lead to that, and then cause me to now, I, if I am a programmer, I do have to live um, in in Seattle or or North Carolina or Austin. I'm not sure, because I mean, if you had a relatively big place like New York, uh, you know, you can have agglomeration in New York without people having to move, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know if those two things are, would be related or not. So I, I don't know if, if, if that is something that if, if what you described um, was was you know labor market mobility leading to gains in agglomeration, I, I don't know if that would be something that would necessarily have to be present or be geo be geographically specific right right so my my thought there is if you're thinking about an economy that is more dynamic that has more that's another way to say more opportunities that's another way to say uh, you've said it multiple times more innovation it's clear that we would want to be in that economy um, and it's clear, I think, that we would want to, the question is, okay, does it lead to other things that we could think of? It's not obvious to me that it does. I just, I just wanted to see if you had, um, if you had thoughts on that. Okay, so what I want to move on to next is, um, as we've hinted at all along, the, the causes are very important here. Right? We've talked about sort of what the effect of declining labor mobility is, why it's important, who wins, who loses. Um, it's hard to think of any losers. I think that's important here. Um, there are not a lot of things that are, that are sort of as lopsided as to say, okay, there's, there's no obvious losers here. We just want more of this. Um, economics is about trade-offs. We've discussed that mm -hmm. a couple of times. So um, are there any of the potential causes that you see as central for what's underlying declining labor mobility? I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of possibilities. And, you know, earlier we talked about things that might be causing this that were benign. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, some things that might be causing this that, that I think most economists would consider less benign. Um, for instance, um, are increases in home ownership causing people to have to stay put? So do you, you know, buy a house and you're locked in to an area because you can't you can't get out of your house. So, uh, you know, increases in home ownership can actually cause decreased labor mobility. Um, and if you know policy artificially drives that, then that would be something I think most economists would think wasn't a you know wasn't wasn't a good wasn't a good thing. Um, some things that um, I've I've read that might be causing this would be. Uh, um, you know, land use regulations mm -hmm. and even uh, occupational licensing, right. right? So if you're if you're licensed to be a, um, you know, pick a profession. If your profession is licensed in Texas and you can't, 
um, you can't move to Kansas or wherever and practice your profession without getting relicensed, then that's an impediment to, oh. to mobility uh, to mobility as, as, as well. And that ties um, in with the point that you made earlier about the economy is so general uh, and so many of these jobs that we would like to have, right? We could, we could be um, hairdressers or we could be nurses. Um, those you can do anywhere. And yet both of those things are good examples of places that are um, occupations that have a lot of licensing involved. And it's not very easy then to move uh, from Texas to Kansas in that scenario. So it, it's sort of a, a, I don't say a paradox, but, but sort of an ironic comparison there. So you've said a couple things. I want I want to unpack those a little bit. When when you come to this literature for the first time, it doesn't occur to you that home ownership is something that could have negative consequences. Um, yeah, I can't speak for anyone else. The the world that I grew up in, home ownership is just universal positive uh, and that uh, that I think has been an American bias for a while now. And it's very interesting to me that we could kind of point to that and say our bias that way um, laid the foundation for the previous financial crisis. So this isn't the first time that we should be clued into home ownership is, is not for everyone all the time. Um, so kind of walk us through how that mechanism works. So, so I have a, a presumably an, an area like a city and then we have home ownership. How does that potentially have those negative mobility consequences that you're talking about? Well, I mean, about? you know, if it if it costs you, uh, you know, if it costs you fifty thousand dollars to get your house ready to sell and sell, then it costs you fifty thousand dollars to move to another city, another state, whatever, to get a job because you have to, you know, you have to repeat that process. You have to find a place to live. Um, you know, if you're a renter, then you just wait for your lease to run out or or whatever, and you you pack up and go. Uh, if you're a homeowner, you've got these extra extra things, and uh, you know how large those are compared to every other factor that you're weighing to to move to change jobs uh, um, is is certainly going to be different for every person. But you know, on on some relevant margin, that's going to matter. Uh, that's that's gonna that's gonna matter to you. So it's it's probably just anecdotally, um, you know, anybody listening to this, if they're if they're thinking about moving, probably the first thing that they do is think about selling their house if they're a homeowner. Yeah, the first thing. It absolutely. has to be. I mean, it has to be the first thing. So so there's a couple of things there um, that I that I'd like to gather your thoughts on. The the first thing is um, home ownership often represents a large portion of of somebody's wealth. Um, and then, like you said, there's the specter of the cost, thousands of dollars in order to move. And that doesn't even take into account the kind of search cost and preparing your house, but just literally you're going to lose money when you sell your house. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to take a chunk out of your wealth because a lot of Americans hold their wealth there. And then, I, of course, I have to do it on the other side, too. Um, that'd be a second point that I'd, that I'd like to touch on. So any comments about... Um, how you view the way that Americans um, save or don't save, hold wealth in their house, um, and view that uh, my house is not just the place that I live, it's it's part of my um, savings almost. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's certainly gonna tie you to a place, right? If you're, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're tied to a house, you know, or a home, as you might call it in, right. in, in this context, it's uh, you're going to have all kinds of costs leaving that, but you know, leaving leaving that leaving that behind, and you know, if your if your wealth is tied to that to that place as well, which a lot of people's are, um, then that's just an additional factor that you're going to consider whether or not you move or not. And you know, again, empirically, these things are pretty easy to easy to measure. And if 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 I and familiar with the literature, this is, I mean, it's important. It's important enough for us to be talking about, but it's, it's not the explanation. What, which is almost right? shocking given how clear the mechanism is that says this is, a, this is why it's hard to move. Right. I mean, it's just as straightforward as can be. You don't think about it at first. Um, sort of those counterintuitive conclusions. Um, did you have more to say about that? No. Or can I? No, so I'm let good. me go to a second point then. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is... I, I'm, if you go and you buy a house and you're not expecting to move, you end up needing to move or finding a better job or for whatever it is reason that you move. It seems unlikely to me that people are going to move to a new location and then rent if you've already been a homeowner. So that's sort of a decision 
you're going to have a hard time un unraveling. Do you I, think that's true? And do you think that has effect on mobility that's I, lasting? I, I mean, I, I, I certainly think it has an effect on, on, on mobility. You know, uh, of course, it'd be, you know, relatively straightforward to measure. Um, and, uh, you know, like, like we talked about before, I mean, this is certainly a factor. Um, you know, it's a nice story to tell. And empirically, there's evidence that this is important, but it's not the main driver. It doesn't seem to be the main driver of what of what's going on here so, with so declining labor mobility. Before we move on to um, the other drivers, because I, I think there, like you said, there's some better and, and maybe even more interesting ones. Uh, you know, the housing, the home ownership, and sort of the the subsequent housing that pops up to to feed that demand. Um, that I think is a double-edged sword, which people don't appreciate all the time. And one of the things that you draw out from this literature, uh, maybe incidentally even, where it's not just the people that are buying the homes that are then tied to the homes and their labor mobility falls, which by the way, would coincide maybe with our 1980s um, timeline. So Could it be. does it does seem like good timing there. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, so I won't speak out of turn. But the cities that are then left behind with these large housing capital um, structures, we got lots of houses in the town and then everybody moves out. If you move and you can't sell your house, that is an enormous, that's an almost unfathomable cost. To almost everybody um, that would be in that situation, that makes the labor mobility problem a vicious cycle, right? Um, and then on top of that, if, if you and I live in the same city, you get a job, move away, um, and n not as many people are moving into the town, that housing stock is fixed. I, I pay a price then too, because now there are more homes on the market. The price of housing is going down. It's doubly dangerous for me to hold my um, wealth in my home since that's a price that can change. Right. And the, the lack of labor market dynamics here it's going to leave a lot more of those homes sitting there unused and unwanted in some areas. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, you know, having your wealth in, 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 in your home can be, um, um, you know, it, it, it might not be a good diversification strategy, is what I think that you're saying. Because um, if you, you know, if you lose your job, you're, or for whatever reason, if you lose your job, you might also suffer a decrease in home value as well. So that's a good transition, sort of jumping off point into something you've already um, alluded to. And and this fits this fits my sort of personal bias. Um, how do you view the regulation of land? Um, I don't think you called it zoning, but zoning would be yeah. a part of that. Um, land use, land use restrictions in general. Um, how do you view that playing a role in lab the decline of labor market mobility? Well, again, it just, you know, any restrictions on how anything is done, we would expect there to be less of it. So any any policy, any social norm, any anything that you can think of that makes it more costly to move or makes it impossible for some people to move is going to show up in these in these trends. So. Um, you know, the regulation and land use and uh, the business practices, the zoning and everything, I, I just lump that in with the occupational licensing idea. So you have, um, you know, you, you, you have policy that makes it more difficult for someone to go do their trade in another area. And uh, it's, it, you know, may not be much. Uh, that would be an empirical question, but uh, um, there would, you know, there'd be less of it. So I think it's tempting to think of both occupational licensing and um, regulations on land use as benign things. They don't sound like they should be harmful and we might think of reasons that we would want those um, to occur. And yet they're unequivocally a um, adding to the cost of moving. Uh, I would argue dramatically Maybe you don't think they're dramatic, but this is definitely not a benign explanation. Yeah, um, it's it's somewhat it's it's serious. Well, I mean, things like that. It's 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 like any other policy or trade offs, uh, right? You know, no one is going to think that that anything is an absolute good. So, in in that sense, it's it's like home ownership, right? There there are lots of reasons that people have identified that suggest that home ownership is a very very good thing. 
um, you know, it, it, it provides a lot of it provides a lot of stability for families. It, it does provide a vehicle for for someone to put their wealth, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, a lot of people think that it it fosters healthy communities, health, healthy um, uh, community schools, and and so the, the the list of positives for home ownership could be could be long. Uh, the list of positives for zoning and occupational licensing could be similarly long, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any downsides to these to these things as well. Economics is full of trade-offs. Right? Nothing is free. It's what you learn. It's what you learn the first day of class that that, that, that nothing is free. So. You know, the 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 process of, of of these things should involve trying to get more of the positives and less of the costs out of these things. And and I think it, those are tremendous points. And um, as a someone who teaches economics, if if I can get people to think along those lines, I, I consider that a pretty serious victory. The the other thing I, that I think, and um, I'm I'm in speculative territory now, uh, is Thinking on the margin really matters. And I wonder about which margin we're on when it comes to land use regulations and, and occupational licensing. Um, we can imagine reasons that those are important, right? I don't want you to build a factory next to my neighborhood. I don't want somebody who has no idea what they're doing uh, being a nurse. And um, if you don't think that the market mechanisms are strong enough to prevent those, mm -hmm then maybe you think that you need those regulations. Um, I think we're beyond that in most cases. And and again, showing my personal bias, speculating a little bit here. Um, and so now that the labor mobility is starting to become a pretty serious issue, something that economists are increasingly worried about, um, I'm, after all, that's why we're here today, I begin to think that the trade-off is starting to tilt the other way. Uh, maybe if you have no occupational licensing, you have no land use regulations, it's just the wild west out there. Maybe labor mobility is through the roof. Um, we're clearly not in that stage right now. Uh, so how, how do you see that well, current trade-off? I mean, if, if the decline in, in, in labor market mobility is a problem, and if it is a problem that can be alleviated with some sort of new policy or changes in current policies, then I, I think that it would be absolutely essential that the political process be willing to consider anything mm -hmm. as part as as part of the solution uh, to this, you know, to, to this to this problem. That's what policies should be, right? So, uh, um, you know, a, a practical prescription on how to make things better. Um, again, as you say, on certain margins, because there are always going to be trade offs with with within those. So, um, you know, again, to the extent that this labor market mobility is, is a concern and to the extent that it could be solved by policy, then we, we need to be able to, anything is on the table. So if Tyler Cowen is right um, and we're facing the great stagnation and this is just a symptom, right? And, and there's some underlying cause that is, you know, the broader drive of innovation and whatnot. Um, then we could see some some importance for that. Um, if I can borrow an, an, another idea, though, I think most cities are similar in these kind of regards, and almost all states in particular are going to be the same on occupational licensing. Um, I always wonder why there isn't, and maybe I underestimate how much is actually going on out there, I always wonder why there isn't more uh, differentiation between cities. All right, may, maybe I should view Lubbock and Lubbock has z almost zero land use regulations and and things are just the wild west out there. Uh, but meanwhile, in Phoenix, Arizona, every square inch is accounted for. And then people could self sort into which of those cities that they like. Um, I'm a little off topic here, but do, do you have any thoughts related to that just sort of? Well, I mean, a, a, a question that is is in the context of uh, of this discussion would, would would be would be this: um, Are cities more alike now than they were 50 years ago? That's 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 the key question. And in terms of the kinds of jobs that are available in cities, the 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 people who are expressing concern of this labor mobility thing basically say yes, they are more alike now than than they than 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 they used to be. And um, you know, you, you you kind of you kind of see that 
right? You kind of see that, um, you know, cities in the Midwest have a different character than cities in Texas, for example. They just look different. And the reason they look different is because 50 years ago, they, they must have been significantly, significantly different, right? Uh, you know, even a place as close as, you know, Kansas City, you drive through Kansas City, and, and it just seems like a Rust Belt city. It just seems more heavy industry. Um, Dallas doesn't seem that way at all. And so at some point in the past, it does look like that people would pursue different occupations based on their city. And now it seems that they that they don't. So people, you know, and this is a very generic statement, all right, individuals don't move as much as they used to for their work because they don't see as much benefit on net as they used to. All right, why else? Like I said, that's a generic statement. Why else would it be happening? So people don't benefit from moving as much as they used to, so they don't move anymore. That's, again, straight out of Econ uh, out of econ 101, which d- doesn't give you an explanation for that. But um, you know, any thinking or any policy related to this has to acknowledge the fact that these people that are staying put are making independent decisions that are the, that are the best decisions they think they can make for, them, for themselves. And um, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's one of the more interesting questions of our, of, of, of our, of our time. I mean, is this an inevitable um, result of the transition that the economy is going through right now? Or is it somehow artificially pushed by some kind of policy that the government is, is, is making? You know, th- those policies in themselves have good ends that they're pursuing, all right, and in in both of those cases, we have this, um, you know, we have this potential harm that is happening to to society that um, you know may or may not be worth the cost, uh, or that may or may not be worth the benefit that we're getting from from staying put. Uh, yeah, fantastic points. Um, I, I think all 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 three of those points uh, very phenomenal. Let's uh, turn then. We've identified housing, one of my pet explanations for this. We've identified land use regulations um, and uh, occupational licensing. Now you've just mentioned policy. Are there things that you point to, whether benign or, or not, that you that you would sort of point the finger at for, for underlying here that we haven't yet discussed? Well, I think one, one last explanation that, uh, that, that we haven't covered is sort of, um, um, you know, it is, is sort of the, the condition of poverty in the United States today that might be driving this. And again, this is not going to be anything that's going to be the end all explanation because we, you know, we, we see this decrease in mobility across all economic, all economic classes. But um, it could be the case that, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, if you were in a condition of poverty, then that would lead you to move. All right. And today it could be the case that if you were in a condition of, of poverty, that might lead you to stay put. All right. So there may have been a switch in, in what the condition of poverty meant uh, for someone in terms of whether or not they should move to another location or, or or stay put, right? You know, I'm I'm from Oklahoma, so we've all read the Grapes of Wrath, and and you know, the family during the Depression fell on hard economic times, and they packed up their stuff and they moved to California. Um, you know, is is that the kind of story that we have today, or not? I don't I don't know if that is. Um, Definitely not as dramatic as that. It doesn't seem to be as dramatic. Of course, it's a book, yeah. Right. So uh, uh, but, you know, but we I don't know. Those- so, so, so the, if uh, you know, granted that that's the, the case, all right. So let's let's take the assumption that 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 flip has happened. Okay. Um, the 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 next question would be, you know, why why is that? So why is the natural response to poverty today more to stay put, and the natural re- response to poverty in generations past was to was was to move all right that to me that's an entirely you know again granting that that's happening mm-hmm. you know um and, and, to, and to, to to begin with that's a very interesting thing to think about because on one hand you might have someone say well you know due to the nature of the economy now if you're poor now um 
because we have, you know, the seemingly, you know, declining social capital, if you want to call it that, then if you become poor or if you are poor, it's absolutely essential that you stay put because that's where your that's where your social safety net is. So that's where your family might be. That's where your house might be. That's where everything that's familiar and everything that supports you might might be. Right. So, so um, is that something that's not true in the past? Then, I, well, that would be an interesting question. I don't. I don't know. Okay. On the other side, you might say, well, um, you know, right now, people don't have a reason to leave and look for work when they become, um, become when they become poor because we have all of the services available that someone can be poor and they can stay put. Right. So when I was, you know, when I was thinking about this, I, I you know, I, I realized that, uh, you know, the answer could be both or neither uh, or, you know, some, you know, it could be one or the other or a combination, you know, a combination of combination of both. But, you know, to think about labor market mobility, especially on the lower ends of um, social economic class for, you know, for lack of a better word, um, you know, it, that, that that becomes so, certainly really easy. Uh, are really essential to think about, right? How has the condition of poverty changed in the United States that might lead someone to become more or less mobile, right? Our stories say that poor people used to move. You know, we had Grapes of Wrath. We had, uh, uh, you know, one of my favorite series of books is Little House on the Prairie, right? And, you know, the, the, the crops failed, so Paul Ingalls had to walk 300 miles to go find work or whatever. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, the question is, do we see that today? You know, of course, those are just stories. We may not have seen that very much in the past, or, or, or not. We're we're influenced by the stories we tell that may or may not reflect uh, that may or may not reflect reality. But uh, you know, that's another explanation uh, for this for this problem. So there's a couple of things there. Um, one, I want to bring back something you said earlier. If the jobs are all the same in all the same places, uh, if if I'm in Oklahoma and my crops fail, and I go to California. The opportunities are different there at that time. Um, right. If if tomorrow I lose my job, why would I go to California? The, the opportunities might be the same there, so so that right. could be uh, maybe a even, small. I haven't even thought about that. I haven't even thought about that. So you know, maybe my two explanations, neither one of them are right, and and maybe the the, the poverty scenario that I gave you is just an extension of of the uh, decrease in in in. Uh, um, economic geographic seg- segregation is what you could call it, right? Right. So, uh, well, you know, if there's if there's no, if there's no opportunities for me in in the Texas Panhandle to be a whatever, uh, then why would I expect there to be any opportunities uh, in California for there to be what whatever? Uh, but you know, a hundred years ago, if the if the wheat crop failed uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, then, well, maybe the grapes didn't fail or whatever they grow in California. Uh, you know, maybe the grapes didn't fail there. So I can go, um, um, you know, instead of harvesting my wheat that's not there anymore, I can I can go do, do the grapes. But, you know, if you sell insurance and nobody's buying insurance in Oklahoma, then probably nobody's going to be buying insurance in California either. So there's no reason to move. So that, that's the third explanation. I actually like that explanation better than the two I gave. I, I think the poverty explanation also has another I don't know if it's underlying or simultaneous. Um, we do have probably greater, definitely than the time period that we'd be talking about the Dust Bowl, but greater uh, safety nets and not just social ones, but actual um, welfare, which can sometimes be location-based. Um, do you view that as part of your your poverty story or do you think those are separate things or maybe not related at all? I, I don't know. That's a really hard question. I don't know. Yeah, I put you on the spot uh, yeah. on something that's that's somewhat tangential to what we're talking about. Um, I wonder sometimes if there's an extra cost to moving um, because so many things now are tied to um, are tied to my location, whether that's job or my physical residence or something, and it's costly to get everything redone. Now, maybe in the grand scheme of things, that's a small cost. Um, but especially if you live in a city, right, we talked about um, sort of this Tibu sorting idea that different towns might ought to be different. Um, if they are different, if I'm wrong, and they are more different than I think, um, part of that could be what it's like to be a poor person in the different cities, um, right? So 
I can't be right about both of those things at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, okay. I think I, I think I've got a, a, you know some thoughts on that. Now, the you know what you're describing here is we have simul, you know, two things are happening simultaneously, right? It's it's costing you more to move and it's benefiting you less to move. Yeah. Good summary. All right. It's and so people people are doing it less and 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 that covers everything that we've talked about in this in this in this podcast so um you know re- regardless of what kind of um social safety net that we have either through government policy or whatever all right let me just use government policy as a as as, as an example of this let's say you know let's say you're poor and you're on food stamps well you're going to get those food stamps no matter where you are right so you don't get any benefit from moving doesn't make any difference so um, because that becomes part of your experience of being poor, all right, there's no benefit in that context to you moving, but then you still have all these costs to moving. All right, so when you're doing the cost-benefit calculation, all right, the, that, that leads you to move less. That leads you to move, to move much less, perhaps. And the same thing is true with your, with your home, uh, the same thing is true with every with 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 every with everything else. All right. So, um, you know, if the, if the mix of jobs in the new place is the same as the old place, you know, all, all of the benefits from moving are, are 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 going seem to be going down. All right. And the costs of moving are either going up or staying or staying the same. So again, economists shouldn't be surprised to see this trend. We just don't know. Um, you know, we just don't know in some non generic sense why they're happening. So, I'm. Um we're not seeing many cases then where sort of this regulation, intervention, government policy, uh, obviously we're talking about trade-offs, but from the perspective of labor mobility um, are helping. So are there potential policies that could be put in place that are gonna help this? For example, this would be something something radical. It just popped into my head. I haven't thought about it um, much, but if this sort of, again, my pet, my pet explanation about is about housing. Um, if if I think that mobility is a problem, and nobody has the incentive, no policymaker has the incentive to do this, so it's a silly example. Um, why not subsidize selling your house or something like that? Which, which of course, I think provides many, maybe all sorts of bad incentives right, for other right. things. Well, I mean, uh, again, that, that, I mean, that might not be a good policy, but that's an example of what a policy might, might be. Right. Um, so you, you, um, you know, you, you provide some sort of incentive to move. The government already does this, Lee. I mean, you get your moving expenses deduct off your taxes under certain circumstances, oh, or maybe you, 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 maybe you used to. Okay, that's Maybe under to the me, new but... tax law, maybe that deduction went away. But if you have job-related moving expenses and you move more than 50 miles or whatever, uh, you know, again, under certain circumstances, those those have tax advantages or, or have had in the past. Right. Um, I'm not. Uh, um, this is something I shouldn't know, but I I don't. Uh, whether or not that particular provision of the law went away. So so that this is uh, you know uh, is, is that any different than 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 helping someone sell their house? No, it's no, not. Clearly not. I mean, it's 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 in, in both sense in both senses, it's the government giving you money uh, if you've had the status of status of moving, and and it's 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 even a big move, right? So you can't change jobs and move across the street. And, and get these tax advantages. It has to be a, um, a, a state lines it has to be thing. a big big geographical switch to, to in order for you to qualify for the uh, you know have the status to use the the correct term to, to, to qualify for the uh, the tax break. Well, my concern is um, when you see something and you can you can point at well land use regulations are having this kind of problem. And instead of saying, well, maybe we should ease up on the land use regulations, for example, or the occupational licensing or any of these policies that we're somewhat concerned about, um, the the instinct is to institute another policy that tries to patch the hole in the boat. Um, and I think that ignores that there's some other trade-off behind that that should always be of concern. And maybe we should stay within the realm of, okay, we should probably ease up on land use regulations because the trade-off is no longer favorable at the point that we're at. Um, so I'm always really hesitant about policies that are like, well, I mean, we created this hole in the boat. Let's just make a policy that, that covers that up. 
um, right. ignoring that now I have a, a Swiss cheese boat full of holes that are all just patched um, that are problems that are created by by other policies. Um, you know, some some problems are fundamental. I don't mean to say that that all of them are are naturally um, policy related. Um, so I w- want to bring this podcast in for a landing. Um, the last question that I'd like to ask um, is just sort of a broad one. We've talked about policy. We've talked about economic factors. Do you think there's a social or cultural factor? Um, it, it seems to me that every young person growing up wants to leave their hometown. So mobility should be high. Now, maybe that's lip service and revealed preferences and that people don't actually want to move out of their hometown. But um, do you see any room for uh, social or cultural explanations for this that maybe economists would overlook? You know, maybe. But I mean, I, I think I'm like you. If there were social trends at, at work here, I, I would think they'd push in the other direction. You know, because people do seem to want to, people do seem to want to leave. At least they say they do. But then, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people end up end up not doing it. So I, I don't know what, um, you know, I don't know what social trends could be could be keeping you know making people stay put uh, more than they more than they more than they used to. So if you go down that road, then you've got to start thinking about well, what's changed. Right. What what's changed? What what's changed in the last fifty years that, that made people uh, want to move um, then and not want to move move now? I mean, I have this is just shot in the dark uh, explanation of uh, you know it, it it may be that uh, after World War II, you know, so many people were displaced uh, by the war. Right? They went to Europe. They went to the Pacific. They went wherever. Um, and then they, they, they came back. So uh, for that generation, leaving home just wasn't that big a deal. And, um, you know, as, as that generation grew up and were replaced by previous generations that hadn't had that experience, then, then humanity's back to, well, this is familiar to me and I don't know anything else. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay, stay here. Um, what do you, what do you think about that? Is that a, that, is that's that a plausible int- idea? That's an interesting explanation. And, and here's why I like it. Um, that's like something on that magnitude of being sent out, going to war. Um, that's like a reset button, but it's happening to an adult or somebody who's on the verge of adulthood who comes back an adult. Um, it's hard to think of things that are going to give you that level of like, I start my life from scratch at 22, then something mm-hmm. the magnitude of, of the war. And so it's like I, I can't think of anything that would that would explain that. So maybe we can t- trace all this decline in labor mobility. It'd be interesting to maybe see what it was even before that. Of course, you have so many things happening in the early right, so 1900s. Right, so many things are different. But but that's an that's an interesting potential explanation. I hadn't thought of that at all, and I I, I love that at least as a as a thought. Um, to say well now if I'm if I'm 22 I'm just graduating college and you know, maybe going off to college is my one chance to move right. away, but you don't put down roots when you're at college for the most part, uh, even if you've gone to a very different area of the country. Um, but then even if you do, that's not going to be reflected in, in labor mobility. Because now I'm just, I, I grew up in Oklahoma and I moved to Michigan for a degree and I just live in Michigan. Like, so there, there's no equivalent sort of, uh, I like that idea of a sort of a reset in adulthood where it's like, I can kind of be from anywhere now. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell a, a personal anecdote. You know, I, I grew up in the Texas Panhandle in the Amarillo area. When I went to school, uh, University of Oklahoma, I told people I was from, from Amarillo. And uh, when, I moved, when I moved back here to the Amarillo area, I started telling people I was from Norman just because it's interesting to be from somewhere else. Right. Um, you know, but, but I didn't go anywhere, right? And so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a, an interesting, uh, maybe opposite of, of the story that you're telling, which, which I like very much. Well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, my guest today has been Rex Pieski. Rex, thank you for joining us on the Econ Buff. Enjoyed it.